excited. You guys stayed for one of the best moments ever. If any of you are, have any, uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say, I'm going to introduce this startup that some of you have, may have heard of. If you guys could please take a seat, that would be great. Um, this startup is what, 80 years old? <laughs> Um, but it is one of those startups that we all look to, we look upward to, we're inspired by, um, and their mission is universal and atmospheric. They are JPL and NASA. Uh, so they're going to spend some time talking to us about how they see blockchain in their space, and we're really excited to hear from them. And afterwards, please don't leave. We will have just a couple of minutes. So thank you very much. I'll turn the time over to Chris, Arun, and Tom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, who knows what JPL does? I asked that from an audience once, and they said, uh, you do great speakers. <laughs> That's not us. In fact, uh, before we introduce ourselves, we wanted to show just a little bit about what JPL does. Because LA, I agree with the previous panels, it's a wonderful place. But it isn't just, uh, it's also about space. So if you can, just show the first picture. And if we can get the lights down a little bit. Yep. Go back. You haven't seen any movies for a while, so this is LA. This is uh, the history of JPL, just up the street. Four minute video.
Uh, oh, that's a lot better. Uh, should I repeat that? <laughs> Could you hear me? All right. Uh, get the lights down just a little bit again. So what's coming next is we're trying to answer the big questions. And as you see these slides, think about how can blockchain help us? Because we're going to ask you in just a second. Uh, these are questions that affect all of humanity. In fact, uh, everybody on Earth, <laughs> and maybe beyond Earth, if we can find them, will be excited. Um, so if you want to participate and see what DSN, uh, Deep Space Network, is doing now, you can go to this website and download the app, and you can find out where we're looking across the universe. Uh, and afterwards, come and ask me, and I'll repeat it. But um, how can we help Mother Earth is one of the key questions. So we're sending up some spacecraft. Uh, what's one of the arguably most important thing on Earth, especially uh, relatable here in Southern California, is water. So we're sending up spacecraft to look back at Earth and find out how the water table is changing, which will help us uh, predict droughts and things like that. Very important for farmers. Uh, what's interesting, it'll generate 100 times more data, just these, these two spacecraft alone, than everything we've done before. So new technologies are necessary, like cloud computing. Um, Anybody know what this is? Europa, who said that? Uh, you got, just got four million bitcoins, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting about this is it had many, many more times of water than Earth has. It's just in a 100 mile ice sheet. But we think there are lakes in there, so if we can, we're gonna send a spacecraft to circle, one day it'll land, it'll drill itself through the ice and become a submarine and find if there are microbial life on Europa. It's a moon of Jupiter. Um, here is, uh, what if a big asteroid was to hit the Earth one day? Uh, we've seen it in science fiction. What do we do? Well, we're looking for Earth 2.0, and this is from the JPL lobby. We've actually found 26 of them so far, uh, exoplanets. And so now we have to figure out how to export humanity uh, if we ever had to. That's one thing we're working on. Uh, so here are some potential exoplanets. It's only 40 light years away. It's kind of a piece of cake. Only takes about 30,000 years to get there with current technology. Uh, this is the surface of Mars. If you've ever been to Death Valley, it looks very similar. Uh, so Death Valley once was a big lake. Did Mars have water? Well, in, we know it has water, but we haven't found the smoking gun that says there was life there. So this is actually the first selfie from a foreign planet. Uh, Curiosity reached its giant robot arms out and took a selfie so we could make so sure that it's healthy. And uh, it is, and we're very happy about that. Um, but we haven't found the smoking gun, so we're sending up another Mars rover called Mars 2020. And uh, we actually are not clever namers, so we will have a naming contest to figure out a better name. Uh, and Mars 2020 will be called something. The last one was named by a 12-year-old from Santa Clara. Uh, it's Curiosity. So we'll see what this one has. But it's going up. Guess when it's launching? Oh, you guys are smart. <laughs> So what's interesting is uh, it's going to go up there and it's going to have bigger wheels so it can go higher up. Uh, it's going to have uh, an instrument to be able to make oxygen in case Matt Damon ever finds himself stuck up there. <laughs> it will have some oxygen for him. Uh, it's going to, uh, we're going to have microphones on it. So if you have any musicians in here, maybe you can hear the music of Mars. Uh, we don't know what the sounds of Mars are yet, but we will. And uh, lastly, it's going to collect uh, samples and cache them for a future spacecraft to come pick them up and bring it back to Earth. So that's pretty exciting. And it's going to have a little buddy. It's going to have a little helicopter with it. And the helicopter will take a ride along, and then it'll hop up, take a, a fly over to see what's behind the hill and see if it's worth going there. All automated. So AI is a really big deal for us, as is Internet of Things or Internet in Space. Now, the next generation of explorers are not going to work like we did. They are going to have access to all of the information we had before. And they're going to access it with new toys and tools like their smartphones or augmented reality. We already have this working where they, scientists from across the world can have a meeting, hold up the rock, look at it, and they're on the surface of Mars as they're doing it. Uh, that's augmented reality the way we look at it. To make it much better, we need more network speed, et cetera, et cetera, but it's coming. So that's really a purpose of, of talking about JPL, just over the hill. Who's ever been to JPL? Uh, raise your hands. Well, there's about a third of you. 
good. If you have, the rest of you haven't, come see us. We're always happy to talk about our favorite home, the 80-year-old startup. So what we wanted to do now is to talk about how could uh, blockchain work for us. So I'm going to ask uh, my fellow panelists here from JPL to introduce themselves and what they do, and uh, then I'll uh, introduce myself and what I do, and then we'll ask, ask for use cases. We have a couple to seed you with. We are not experts in this. We are the fishermen wanting to learn how to fish, and you are the teachers. So uh, it's an unusual situation because we're usually pretty deep in technology. So we're looking forward to it. Chris, you want to start? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, hi. Hey, I'm, I'm Chris Matman. Um, I'm an associate uh, CTIO in Tom's office, in the office of the CIO. I work on advanced IT research and open source software projects. That's why I asked the two questions on open source when people were talking about it earlier. Uh, yeah, so um, anyways, that's me. I'll let Arun introduce himself. I'm, uh, so, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not as experienced as uh, Tom and Chris at JPL. Uh, I just joined JPL about three years ago. Um, my focus is on actually applying AI and machine learning techniques to cybersecurity problems. Um, currently, I'm actually exploring um, how blockchain, uh, how the properties of blockchain can be used to solve uh, some of our problems within JPL. Um, and there are many as we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them. Um, so, yeah. And so, I'm a Chief Technology and Innovation Officer for IT at JPL. And we tend to look at what the future, we use a surfing metaphor. So, a surfer, anybody surf in here? Wow, just like four people in LA? <laughs> Gosh, you guys are too deep in blockchain. <laughs> so a surfer will look at the swells coming, and then they look at the waves and get interested. And when it becomes a surfable wave, they'll paddle like crazy, hop on the wave, and get a great ride, or break it off, because it wasn't a great ride. If they paddled for everything, they would never get a ride, and they'd just tire themselves out. Uh, and if they uh, took every wave, they would not catch the good ones. So that's how we look at technology. So we're very deep into uh, AI and Internet of Things, uh, cloud computing, We've been doing that for over 10 years. So the thing that's coming now, uh, but we talked about it in September and we had it as a wait and watch because there's no interesting use case. And all of a sudden we start hearing from you folks that, you know what, blockchain is much more interesting than we thought. So now if we can find an interesting use case, we're going to explore it and try it and experiment. And JPL takes in about 1,000 students uh, every summer. We have, there's about 6,000 of us uh, in pa near Pasadena. So now we're looking for the use cases and looking to experiment. Uh, so I'm going to ask my fellow panelists to come up with some use cases. And we're going to ask you guys to uh, kind of comment on them, think, see if it's doable or crazy, and come up with some of the use cases. Who wants to start? Okay, I guess it's me. Uh, okay, so when Tom asked me to participate on this panel, I was like, okay, I've read about blockchain, but I haven't done anything with it. That's actually strange, because normally I do stuff with technology, but I, um, I have a couple of ideas about use cases and how it's being used. A colleague of mine at CERN is starting a company called Ovrium. I don't know if you would call it a stealth startup. We asked him that, but he said, no, it's not stealth. So anyways, I guess it's called Overham. And the big thing that they're working on, and I think this is a really valid use case potentially for JPL, is we have a lot of scientists who write publications and author publications in scientific journals and literature. And the real big problem with that right now is that you have sort of a scenario use case that goes like this. Uh, my research as a PhD student um, you know, is funded by government grants. Um, so the government pays for the work that's done, and when I make a publication, inevitably, uh, before the era, you know, era of open access now, and even still, uh, you know, I might go after high-impact journals. Most of them have a paywall uh, around them. In other words, I have to pay the journal uh, to make that paper available, and then uh, libraries, places, uh, science places like JPL, our library, big research institutions, they pay again for the research that the government already funded just to make it available in sort of a site-wide license to people. So this, this company, Overham, uh, you know, I think is, is working in this space of blockchain, is trying to think about how to create a cryptocurrency that would take um, sort of the non-scientific, non-statistical processes behind publishing scientific literature and make a cryptocurrency uh, out of that. And then, you know, basically reward people who do peer reviews and journals and things like that, who largely contribute their time in a volunteer fashion, reward them with coin for reviewing scientific papers and literature and, and making the science available 
uh, you know, in a more egalitarian fashion. So that's one use case I have that I'm really interested in feedback from you guys on. The other, uh, Let's get feedback. yeah, yeah, well, okay, well, I'm happy to stop there. So does, does anyone, had anyone thought of using Bitcoin like that? Or, I'm sorry, blockchain like that? Raise your hand if you think it's a valid use case. Oh, that's good. Overim will be happy to hear that. Cool, I know, they will, I was going to say. So, okay. Go ahead. I read a lot. I have not read that. No, I haven't. Literary machines. It's a very old um, narrative from 1980, pre-HTML, where the idea would be to publish and have attribution of every element in the publication trackable throughout history. I think the Xanadu project came out of that. Yeah, I've heard of that one. And so there may be some synergy between those thoughts and the kind of use case you're describing. That's great. Yeah, um, you know, open access is my first foray. You know, I'll tell you a quick example for me. You know, the heyday of, of my domain or discipline of computer science was publishing in a journal that typically domain discipline sciences, Earth and planetary or whatever, is like their best one in nature. I had a publication in Nature in 2013. I got a bunch of crap from my colleagues who couldn't access the paper because it was behind a paywall. And I was like, are everybody supposed to publish in that? <laughs> you know, or whatever. But that was my first sort of exposure to the problems. I mean, they were all kind of there, but that kind of put it front and center for me. Um, it's a critical mass problem. Yeah. If you get enough of you guys to move, then everyone will go. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Great um, point. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy to defer to our reader. If you, yeah, go ahead. Why don't you give yours, and I'll go back to mine. Um, there are two, two use cases within JPL that, uh, which we have been exploring, uh, which we think we can solve with, um, with, with, with blockchains. So um, one problem that our um, scientists have is that so they get data from a variety of sources, and most of, this, uh, most of this data comes from spacecrafts. It goes through various intermediate processing nodes, and then it finally ends up in some database where the scientists access the uh, products from. Now, um, very often these uh, intermediate processing nodes are not within the U.S. They are outside. They are in different parts of the U.S. They're not, um, and, they are, and, and there's no and there's no protocol which uh, actually um, sort of um, controls or administers these places. So um, everybody knows that the end what the end data product looks like, and the and then the data just flows from the spacecraft to to the end nodes. Uh, so one big problem that we have is that scientists consume this consume this data, and then they do their modeling and their predictions on this data without really checking for the accuracy of the data, without really understanding if the data has been modified in some way, maliciously or non-maliciously, in, in, in that workflow from the spacecraft to the, to the end database. So <clears throat> one potential use case for blockchain is to actually track prominence and ensure that the, that the data that is finally uh, ends up in the hands of a scientist is actually what he expects it to be. And he can actually easily track the prominence of what, where the data came from and, and how it got um, processed, what sort of uh, operations were done on it, um, and so on. Um, so that is, that is one use case. So this would basically be a blockchain that would span the spacecraft to the end, you know, to the, to the, uh, to the end user, essentially. Um, that's one. Do, should we wait? Yeah, let's get, let's get feedback. We'll feedback. take one each and just keep going. But what do you guys think about that one? Uh, <clears throat> and yes, in the back. Sure. Yeah, so the, 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 so the current infrastructure that exists is basically, uh, let's say it's a patchwork of processes, like which ensure data integrity from the source to the, tar to the target. Uh, but we think the blockchain can actually solve this very elegantly and, and also provide more benefits than what exists today. Um, is it not already redundant across the nodes? Uh, is what not redundant? The, the data uh, processing. Only come from certain nodes, and there's no way to, you know, parallelize it compared to anything else. So I think that the issue is not about uh, not losing data because we don't lose it. We do copy it and we have it safely. But it's the the provenance 
make sure nobody has to yeah, and then with it. And the provenance and also the fact that, um, so because these processing nodes exist in places which let's say JPL doesn't control, the security standards at that particular place might not be what we expect them to be. So data could be easily manipulated. And sometimes uh, what happens is the data also gets converted into intermediate products by scripts and people. Um, so there's no way to really ensure integrity of that. So basically what happens at the end is the, the scientist just receives that data and then they have to work with it. Um, and, and you're making impo important predictions based on the data. Like you're, you're basically forecasting weather, you're forecasting uh, you know, your, 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 your modeling and so on depends on that. Um, so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Imagine that the system that does all of that scientific data management is distributed and largely antiquated. And, that, and that's kind of what he's talking yeah. about. It is a blockchain right now, but it's not managed using that technology. Uh, yeah. There was a comment over here first. I think you should go over there. Okay. Yeah. I, if I could make a, a meta comment, which is meant in good faith. It is to for, for you guys possibly to share with this with this group areas where there's a trust breakdown somewhere and areas where you wish you could do something but there's a concern about trust because the the thing that I, and I'm like two weeks ahead of you guys in terms of so I'm no expert right but I guess that does make me an expert if I've been looking at this for all the two weeks the, the thing that's most powerful about distributed ledgers in my, as, as I look at it, is that it allows you to build trust and create transactions where there isn't otherwise trust. I'm gonna come up with a dumb example and you guys have come up with one much better, I hope, which is let's say you wanted to share a bunch of data with people all over the world or you wanted to get data from people all over the world. Again, this is dumb because I don't know enough about what you guys do, but I'm thinking about all these guys in their backyards looking for comments, right? But you don't know if you can trust that this person is giving valid data, you'd like some method for other people to assess the data. It, that kind of thing I think might so, get better feedback from this group. So I don't interrupt you, but just real quick. Um, that's a little bit about what Arun was saying. Yeah, no, so I, imagine I, a distributed system of like big scientific missions, instruments on spaceborne platforms, airborne platforms, things in situ on the ground, and generation of those data not necessarily by humans, in the case that you just mentioned in their backyard, but by big data processing systems that are doing that. And imagine a chain of custody of that that's largely antiquated, and a bunch of old systems, you know, that, that's kind of what Arun was saying. That's a, a little bit of, of what he was talking about. But I have a use case, just when it's my turn, exactly what you're talking about. I think we killed that dead horse. Go to your All right. <laughs> so, so my use case is... We'll get back to it. We'll get back to it. Yes, I say we get back to it. There's only 16 minutes. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get back to it. But we're going to be here afterwards. Uh, and there's something about that vodka that <laughs> makes the ideas come through. Um, so my use case was... One of our biggest problems is if you, so I mentioned two of those satellites are going to create a hundred times more data than everything we've ever done. It doesn't fit in our data centers anymore. So, and we're realizing that cloud computing is a big deal. So, but now we distribute our identities everywhere. And it's very difficult. You log in with this ID, then with this ID, et cetera. So my use case is, is there a way of proving that this is really Chris Matman and not somebody impersonating Chris Matman. So it's the identity uh, first, and then the authorization of what he's allowed to do. Uh, anybody have any, that's one of our biggest grains in the machinery right now. Anybody have any ideas? Adam. I think that's a great use case, and it fits into a larger suggestion for use case that I think is an inverse of what people usually think of as being the best use You guys develop technologies that are then brought into the broader economy. One example, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe anti-life brakes came from the space shuttle or something along those lines. Now you can get them on a Toyota Corolla. I think if you think about blockchain, you're seeing cases in industry where it's being used, and that same paradigm of lead user generation could be inverted. So if you look at the best places where blockchain is being used now, it may be some of the more mundane ancillary elements of your mission, Things like payments processing, things like data verification, and to your point, uh, personnel verification. Those are some great places where you could save substantial amounts of money by gaining some efficiencies, and then that money would be freed up for other projects. Thank you. That's great. That was, thank you. There was another thought. Uh, uh, blue shirt. Standards 
for what they call PIDs, decentralized identifiers. And uh, that, I think, is going to be uh, one of the biggest mainstream uses of blockchain. Before payments become mainstream, all that is, they'll be social security, especially with the Equifax and all those pre-tools <laughs> lately. I think, I think there's good, you get, JPL could benefit so much, you really just want to see collaboration. And just to stretch it a little bit further, uh, what we're really doing is distributing all the processing across the world. So it's not just going to be people, it's going to be processes, uh, programs. How do you know this program is who it says it is? So now you're getting amazing scale that is one of the problems we've heard of with uh, blockchain. It doesn't scale well enough. Uh, but it's something that uh, we would... Thank you for both of you, it's great. We're, gonna, we're looking to, in, in the end, what are we going to experiment on? What do we try first? That's kind of what we're fishing for. Um, I don't know what problems that exist in the world, so maybe you've already solved this, but um, communication between all of these AIs around the world um, seems like it would be difficult, and because the blockchain solves the, dece the Byzantine general problem in a decentralized fashion, I wonder if there's an application for are you thinking that I'm not quite understanding that the per, that the person communicates is who they say they are? No, or? Oh, oh, yeah, oh. I, I yeah, no, you're right. That's interesting. Uh, thank you for that. We'll think about that. Let's do one more and then we'll go to the next use case for that room. Yes? Um, so with regards to identifying if the individual broadcasting this is truly who they say they are, I don't know if blockchain is necessarily like the default route to take, particularly because there's other measures you can implement, such as like a dedicated IP address. However, uh, if that's not what you're looking for and you want something a little more nuanced than that, perhaps a ledger of, say, IPs from which that user broadcasts something that tracks like the history of which device they've used to do something, and like if one device seems like oddly conspicuous in the history of devices they've been on, then the network can flag that as being malicious, and there would presumably be some force that they can handle. So, that fits our rules. Yeah, that's that's the next use case that I was going to talk about. Is basically this asset tracking and asset verification. That's exactly what this is. So I think he's. Pretty much covered it really well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's so, what, um, I mean, yeah, I think there's really nothing more to say to that, but that's exactly what we're trying to do in the, in the sec next use case. Um, uh, yeah, I think. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, got, I got one for you guys. I got, I got one for you guys. So, so, as far as I can understand from you know, looking into blockchain and, and things like that, it seems like it also includes kind of an a la carte menu of a number of different technological advances distributed hashes for communication, provenance, which is really important to us in science data and things like that, um, uh, you know, assurance, you know, of identity and things. And so for us, like, you know, you can imagine what we do at JPL is that we use all those things, kind of like what, what you said in a variety, you know, both science, engineering, and mission applications. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is prioritize how to invest or, or do things and use that a la carte menu, you know, of blockchain and, and, you know, which technologies and, you know, which ones are scalable, you know, to, you know, our data set. So, I, you know, any recommendations as to what other things in that a la carte menu that we should be looking at? Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry. Um, so, first of all, given the nature of the kind of data you guys are presumably transmitting from satellites, um, one of the problems with using like, the earlier iterations of blockchain um, is that most of them function on like SHA-256, and if you've been tracking Bitcoin, notoriously, like, it slows down the more people use it. Um, so combined with the nature of the data you're transmitting, like, I think over time it's going to be harder to upload research to any sort of centralized databases you guys plan on using. Um, there are newer versions of, so to speak, blockchains and ledgers that are based off of things like Dijkstra's algorithm, for instance, so like the distance between nodes and minimums. Um, there's also Tangle, which requires every node that makes any sort of submission to authenticate two transmissions before it. So I think um, the kind of the kind of infrastructure that Bitcoin uses should probably be avoided if you guys care about uh, both speed and sensitivity. 
Yeah, yeah we're not necessarily uh, married to any particular blockchain. I mean, so uh, I think that so Tangle is the one which is used by uh, the uh, which uh, uh, iOS, right? I mean, and Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've been looking at Ethereum for uh, some of the new properties that it brings and the ability to actually, it's, it's Turing complete and so on, so that also adds some interesting stuff. Uh, but yeah, the blockchain itself, uh, we haven't really settled on a technology. In fact, we have uh, an even bigger issue before we get to a blockchain. Uh, we have another issue that uh, whether we should use a private block, uh, have a private blockchain or a public blockchain. So if you have any thoughts on that, that's so something that we are uh, interested to hear about. Okay, so I had another one, a uh, question for you guys. Uh, oh, there, was, there, was there an answer? I, I, oh. I strongly believe that you should be using private iteration here. I mean, I don't know, I, I think that using a public iteration just opens up the possibility of manipulation or malicious actors kind of attacking you guys. So I strongly believe that you should be private. Okay. And one of the ones that uh, you answered before everyone had to ask about it was the parts that go on spacecraft. Uh, can we have verified that they are, they have been tampered with all the way up? So if something goes wrong in space, we just lose communication. How do we track back to see what was wrong? And we think blockchain could help, but for it to help, all the parts must be part of blockchain. So that's one of the challenges, but it's one of those you got to start somewhere. And we could even say, if you're going to build a, space, a part for our spacecraft, you better put it on blockchain or we're not going to award you the contract. So there are ways of, of getting there. Another question for you. Uh, who in here has ever bought or sold Bitcoin? This is great. <laughs> I love this. Now, to the follow-up question. Who has explained to your significant other or parent why this was a good idea? And were you successful before it went up in value? All right. Huh? Okay, yes. So here's the issue. Uh, for us to explain... So it's a technology and it's a business case. We have to be able to explain to the board what is blockchain and why is it valuable for us to even make first iteration. So to do that, we need an experiment that say, hey, look, it worked. This is valuable. But then we have to have explainable blockchain. And that's our challenge to you all. Tell us how. We are not, we're scientists and engineers, but we're not very good at it. So, Make sure you practice your elevator pitch, and I'm going to hear one in a second, so that to help us help you evolve blockchain. Without it, it's not going to happen. Yes, what's the elevator pitch up there? Oh, no, I was going to say, you guys host the hackathon, like, like the NASA space, space app hackathon. Oh, you know about that. Yeah, we're going to have to Good. So we actually heard uh, today that there's going to be three days of blockchain hackathon here uh, at UCLA, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We heard that earlier today. That's fantastic. And I think that's probably the way. But it's got to be explained why is it good and what's the, what's the story. So any, for us to explain to engineers and scientists that are very cynical, they're going to say, well, you can do seven transactions a minute. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's, it's, we have to be able to explain it at all levels. Yes, but thank you for that. Thanks for coming for the Space App Challenge. Uh, my cell is always secure, decentralized, sensor-resistant. Say that again. I'm going to repeat it. Secure, secure decentralized, decentralized sensor-resistant, sensor-resistant ledger. ledger. So that usually gets the ball started. Can we have some applause for that? Level of applause for that explanation. It's okay, based on the applause, but <laughs> at least you get applause. <laughs> I'd like to share my experience, because we talk, we can talk about a lot of benefits, but sometimes it's very hard to convince the non-technical person why you work. But I think I will always ask the person, give me 10 minutes, let me explain what's hash. So after you understand what's hash, then it will be easier to convince the people why you work, why you trust, why you can trust the system. I think the hash is important. The hash. The hash. Yeah. What is uh, hash? Level of applause. <laughs> so together, there's doubling the applause. Okay, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> so, so I have a question for the community. Um, you know, I'm a veteran of the old internet days, the W3C, Apache, I'm on the board of directors at Apache. Um, 
Apache and the internet was successful because of things like the W3C and CERN and openness like ITEF and things like RFCs and all of those things. What is the equivalent in the blockchain community? Do those exist? I mean, I, I don't know, but do, do those exist? Because I'm, I'd be worried if they don't. You know, and there's always an issue of corporate control. You know, it used to happen with Covalent and the Apache web server, and you know, it happened with Hadoop and Cloudera and Hortworks, and you know, it's happening with Spark. <laughs> and so, you know, all of that stuff will exist, but you know, as long as there's a community and there's an open process and an open set of standards. So does that exist for blockchain? I don't think so. Well, I think it's project -based. I'm a little worried then. <laughs> I think it's project based yeah. to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty. Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, would you support if there was an RFC process? It's open source. Yeah. Yeah, it's open source. It's blockchain. Well, I got it. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Okay, open source and open code is good. Uh, process to build that and standardize it, you know, is also good. So, what's where's that? Oh, that's good. Sure. 